Ben Raphael, who's coming to us today from Princeton. And um, I'll give you a little bit of history of how we ended up here. And so uh, he did his bachelor's in maths, uh, a minor in biology at MIT in 1996. And he then went on to do a PhD in mathematics at UCSD and got that in 2002. And that looked fairly theoretical. It was, from, yeah. What was the title of it? Do you it remember? Like spectral sets and rational dilation. Functional yes. analysis, yeah. So real hard collaboration here. Mm -hmm. But then he realized that um, he wanted to do something that was a bit more applied and um, decided to begin a journey in bioinformatics. Um, and that was also at UCSD. And he got one of the uh, prestigious boroughs welcome postdoc fellowships. Um, and that was between 2002 and 2006. And then he joined Brown as faculty and stayed there in 2006 and stayed there for 10 years where he kind of built a computational um, molecular biology program and then moved to Princeton in 2016. And it was not long after he got there where we first met, although I didn't know I'd met him, but we were actually at the same workshop. <laughs> and that was on uh, uh, mathematical methods and cancer evolution and heterogeneity. Uh, and that was held at the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study, um, which was fun. And then um, it was 22, 23? Yeah. 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 22. Yeah. Chandler and I went to this really cool uh, meeting in a castle in Italy well, in uh, Bertano. It was hard to get to, but it was worth it when we got there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Gordon that, Conference? You know, it was a meeting that I guess um, Trevor, um, Andrea Sotoriva, and Sorab Shah. Sorab Shah had organized. And so it was. I'm not sure what that meeting was. I just hope to God we get back there sometime. It was so much fun. Anyway, um, a bit of a different presentation, but you know, the truth is that as as we use more and more of the kind of data that's emerging, especially some spatial transcriptomics, mutational data, I think it's useful for us to look at people who are building some of those tool sets and he builds a lot of really cool tools and understand where he's coming from and given his mathematical background it seemed like this would be a good to dipping our toe into that water so so ben looking forward great. to it thanks so much thanks sandy thanks for the, the great intro and uh yeah I, i'm i'm excited to be here because uh you know, i was ex-mathematician, I guess, maybe still a mathematician, <laughs> but uh, maybe looking to get back into the game. And I think there's, we will see some, I think, new convergence that's going to happen between some of the omics tools and, and that model. Uh, so I, I'm going to tell you a, a bit about some of the um, computational approaches we've been developing to look at, at tumor heterogeneity. And it's going. So, you know, I, I'm sure I don't need to tell this audience that, that tumors are highly heterogeneous. Uh, they, you know, are heterogeneous over time because tumors, you know, have, have evolved and acquired somatic mutations across all genomic scales, and they're heterogeneous in space, you know, because the tumor is uh, supported by a rich microenvironment, the tumor microenvironment of, of various types of normal cells and immune cells uh, that, are, that are interacting and supporting or antagonizing the tumor. So it's uh, really quite essential to, you know, quantify both of these processes, uh, heterogeneity over time and, and across space. Uh, and so, you know, natural questions, I guess, first is how, to, how do you measure the heterogeneity? And there's heterogeneity of all different types. So I'm gonna focus mostly on like genetic, epigenetic and transcriptomic heterogeneity. And you know, often you're, you're measuring it, you're measuring at the time you took the biopsy. Uh, but you certainly like to infer what happened in the past. Often we get, you don't get to observe tumors over, you know, their, development from the first cell to the present. And so what can we infer about the past from, from measurements uh, at, at the present? And so these are sort of two of the questions that, that I hope to uh, show you some tools for, for answering. And of course, you know, the beginning part for both of this is, is to get the data, right? And so uh, the data has, has really changed over the past decade because there have been sort of really two transformations in how we can measure DNA and RNA and also to some extent protein. Uh, from tumors. You know, about 10 years ago, most of the DNA or RNA measurements you saw of tumors were of a bulk tumor sample. You know? So this gave you a single aggregate measurement that was a mixture of all the different cells within the tumor. And so you could do useful things with this, but you miss a lot, especially in terms of, of heterogeneity. 
And so as, as of course, many of you know, uh, the kind of first revolution starting around 10 years ago was technologies that uh, allowed one to individually barcode, you know, thousands or millions of cells from a tissue sample and, uh, and then measure DNA and RNA from those barcoded cells. Uh, but these measurements, although now much better perhaps than bulk because you're getting single cell measurements, were from disassociated cells from the tumor. So you lost the spatial context that's uh, really important for looking at interactions between cells. And so the, the second revolution, which is you know, ongoing, is the ability to measure DNA, RNA, or protein, or other small molecules uh, from you know, thousands to millions of spatially resolved locations. And so some of these technologies involve sort of similar ideas of barcoding individual cells, but barcoding them in a way that you can also preserve uh, spatial location. So, you know, with thinking now about single cell and spatial, one can sort of say, well, you know, we have now the technologies to start really answering these questions about tumor heterogeneity, much more so than we had in the days of, of bulk sequencing. But of course, you know, there, there's no panacea, you know, all of these technologies have, have limitations. And so what I hope to show you today is that different limitations of different technologies, and you'll see a few, uh, can be addressed with better computational algorithms or better modeling approaches. And so you can really just have this tight coupling of the technology to the computational analysis to really unlock some of the underlying biology. So I'm going to start uh, with a uh, single cell uh, and a couple of different uh, single cell technologies. And one was a uh, technology that uh, we were quite excited about, single cell DNA sequencing. Uh, and uh, there are different single cell DNA sequencing technologies. One of the newer ones is from a company called uh, Mission Bio, and they have a technology called uh, the Tapestry Platform. And what this platform does is uh, it does uh, targeted single cell DNA sequencing. So you can design uh, a, a series of amplicons, about 500 amplicons. So these are maybe about 200 to 300 uh, base pairs in length. Uh, and then you can sequence those amplicons to relatively high coverage, about 50x coverage per cell for thousands of cells. Uh, and so this is you know, really exciting. And we uh, started working with Chris Abusio Donahue at Memorial Sloan Kettering, a pancreatic cancer expert who had applied uh, mission biotechnology to uh, look at pancreatic tumor evolution. And so if you think about what you might be able to measure with you know, 50x coverage of small regions of the genome, you can very reliably identify single nucleotide mutations by looking at you know, how these uh, individual sequence reads differ from the reference genome. But across the other scales of, of genomic events, uh, you maybe don't have such great resolution for measuring copy number changes, duplications or deletions of genomes or, or rearrangements. So as you think about building a, uh, a phylogeny, building sort of a, a reconstruction of what happened in the past, the marker you have that you can measure reliably on this technology is the single nucleotide variant. So before you go on, yeah. because this audience doesn't necessarily know this lingo very well, yeah. what does it mean 50X coverage? Ah, good, okay, great. So uh, <laughs> here, I, yeah, this is a, okay, this is good. Um, so uh, 50X means that on average, you have uh, on average 50 reads covering a position of the genome. Okay. So these are yeah, what I'm showing here are these individual reads. Uh, if you want to identify that there's a, a somatic mutation, a single nucleotide mutation at this position, then you would have your reads here from the, the, the tumor cell, and you would see that there's some difference, and I didn't sort of record it here, but we might see that instead of getting a G, we might have observed a T, right? And uh, because there's sequencing error, uh, and, and the you know, random uh, coverage of these things, higher coverage is better. You get more data that tells you that you're really sure that there's a mutation. So for having um, 50 reads on average, if I see, you know, uh, 50 or 60, you know, if I see 30 or 40 of the reads that have the mutation, I'm very confident in it. Whereas if I saw one or two, it might just be an error in the series. Okay? So higher, higher coverage, better for doing this sort of statistical. But this is single cell, right? This is single cell, yeah. So we're doing this for you know thousands of cells. So the, the great thing about the technology is that you get um, this high coverage in a single cell and you have it for thousands of cells. So with that 50X, you're doing that read multiple times for that single cell's DNA. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then the um, when people talk about depth, yeah. 
Um, is that really yeah, the to the coverage of depth are usually a synonym yes. thing. Yeah, yeah. Just and I want it's everyone it's to feel yeah, free yeah. to yeah. to yeah. ask Ben. We do have time and this I know this is the first of this type of talks and I want everyone to try and grasp what he's saying. So if you have a question, ask him. They're not shy normally, but I know because this is not a comfort zone for them. Yeah, they might not so, ask. So, so this is great. I thought, I mean, I thought we had an hour block. I noticed this morning there's an hour and a half. Yeah, so <laughs> interrupt at any time, you know, and, 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 and ask, ask questions and clarifications. You know, there's different things I want to talk about yeah. that I plan to talk about, but we can jettison any single one if, you know, mm -hmm. one of these is more interesting than the others. Okay, uh, so let me show you a very simple version of what this data looks like. So uh, in this particular uh, sample we were looking at, uh, this is one patient. We had sequenced from two different regions of this pancreatic tumor, uh, 987 cells from one region and 1,166 cells from the other. Okay, you then identify mutations, single nucleotide mutations by looking at differences in these reads. And so the data you get looks like uh, this. Uh, Here's what we call a mutation matrix. So this is you know, roughly 2,000 cells in the, the one direction here. Uh, and uh, there are just a handful of mutations that one calls reliably in this, in this tumor. So there's like a mutation in this gene SBTA1. Uh, there's two different mutations in, in this gene TGBFR, FGFR1, et cetera. Okay? And what I'm showing you here, in black, there's a little line if this uh, a gene is mutated in this particular cell. Okay, so that's what's in black. That's a mutation that's present. Uh, if we didn't measure a mutation in that cell, in that gene, that's the sort of white line here. And then uh, the other thing is what's, what's called missing. So what does missing mean? Well, missing means we're not sure if there's a mutation in that uh, position, in that gene in that cell, because when we did the sequencing, this process was random when we sequence, and sometimes we don't have enough reads that cover that position. So we can't make a call as to whether or not there's a mutation. It's missing data. We don't know. No information. Okay. Can I ask briefly, so when you when the cells are removed from that patient sample, they're disassociated? Yeah, they're disassociated, yeah. Yeah, so you have to like... And then sort of individually... disassociated and individually barcoded and, yeah. and then sequenced with these barcodes. So what you end up so doing you, is... So you've got an, an area, but you've lost space. Yeah. So we've totally lost space here, disassociated cells. Uh, so here's the data. Now, all of these cells are from the same pancreatic tumor, two different regions, but same pancreatic tumor. So one would think that they all were descended from the original founder cell of that tumor, the monoclonal tumor, as most of them we assume they are. And so what we would hope to be able to do would be to recover a uh, a tree of sort of phylogenetic trees. So if you've done you know, species evolution, something that would tell us you know, which cells are related to which cells according to the mutations that they share. Okay, so from this data, we can try to build one of these trees. So for example, in this cartoon, you know, this group of cells might share mutations you know, one, two, and three, right? So I would, that's why they're together. Whereas this group of cells shares mutations you know, one, two, four, and five, et cetera. So we'd like to build one of these trees. Yes. Now, one also yep. one question about the data set. Um, are the normal cells excluded from the analysis? Or no. Uh, and so the normal cells are excluded to the extent that when you, you know, cut out the region of the tumor that you want to sequence, you, you know, perhaps are trying to do this in a way that you've taken a sample that's they are homogeneous. Of homogeneous. However, that's a challenging process. Mm -hmm. And in pancreatic tumors, actually, that's extremely challenging because pancreatic tumors are known to be very admixed, very kind of really diffuse tumors. So you often get high rates of, of normal cells when you do this sequence. And also the inf infiltrating uh, immune cells and so on might be still... Exactly. Yeah. But... Yeah. 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 Yep, so you'll, you'll have taken a region, this is the total number of cells, but only some fraction of cells will be actually uh, cancer cells, and the rest might be normal cells. And the way you would hope to distinguish those is, again, via these somatic mutations. 
And so for those that, again, might not know that when you're building those phylogeny, there is a tool set for doing that, right? Yeah. And you've been involved with some of that. Hopefully, exactly. to, yeah. hopefully you can talk about I'm going to talk about that a little bit in the next slides, yeah. But it would be useful to sort of, I think, articulate the assumptions behind that. Um, yeah. Because yeah. you behind that tool set. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So you need, you need a model for how uh, evolution happens here in order to do this. Uh, and so if we think about our uh, data, we have marked a mutation as present or absent, or there's missing data. Uh, no, I can, Feel free to can, can use the chalk use behind you. Okay. There's a dust, there's also a bunch right. of different colors of chalk. And have to get a photo of <laughs> you're doing some mathematics. <laughs> so, you know, I, I was, you know, hiding some of the things here, but we really have sort of three, three states. So the other way of thinking about this uh, matrix is that we could make zero be the state where there's no mutation. So this is what I call the absent state. One is when there's a somatic mutation. And then maybe question mark is the missing state. So this matrix I'm drawing here in, in uh, you know, this, this, this form with the three colors, you could also, if you want to think about the data, have, have written this out in terms of, you know, for each cell, uh, and each mutation, is it present or not in this cell? So maybe, uh, you know, for this first cell, it might have, you know, if we think about our mutations that we measured, it would be C, D, E, et cetera. Maybe it doesn't have mutations A and B. It has C and D. E, we're not sure about. Right? And similarly, there might be, uh, you know, another cell that has uh, C and D and A and doesn't have these. Now you can start looking at data like this and you could say, oh, well, you know, uh, these first two cells, I mean, they have, they share these mutations. Uh, so that might indicate that they're more closely related, right? Maybe this third cell might, you know, have a different pattern. And so that might start to suggest to us, well, you know, this third cell is probably not as closely related as these first two because of the patterns of mutations. So in order then to build these trees, you have to uh, describe what's the model of how mutations change state. So these are what are called sometimes the states of the mutation. So here there's sort of this, this three state model. And so the most general model, we wanna draw this mathematically, we've got for each mutation, it's got two states plus it's got missing. It starts with there not being a somatic mutation, a somatic mutation could then happen in a cell, but then maybe that mutation could revert back to the original state. So this would be the most general model that one could draw. Uh, it turns out that for analyzing uh, this type of data where there's high rates of error, often what people have done is they've made a simplifying assumption. And the simplifying assumption is that because these are, you know, somatic mutations, uh, we, they start at the, you know, the not the, the wild type state. Um, and because their genome is long, it's probably pretty rare that a mutation will happen at the exact same position in the genome many times. So now if I think about here's mutation A, you know, uh, mutation, uh, when to pick, let me pick one that's not a DNA letter. <laughs> mutation D means this position in the genome has changed. Okay. But, you know, all things being equal, maybe once this mutation happens here, it's very unlikely that there'll be another mutation at the same position. So this is a simplified model that's been used a lot, and I'm going to show you this on the slide. This model where mutation can only be gained and never lost is what is sometimes called the infinite sites or perfect phylogeny. Okay, so that's exactly this type of evolutionary model. It's what we call a constrained model because it doesn't allow for every possible change to happen. 
And this is what has been done in single cell sequencing. Again, because of these high rates of missing data and, uh, and, and error, um, if we constrain the phylogeny, constrain the model, we can start to fill in the missing data according to this model. So one of the now classic ways to do this is an algorithm from Nico Berenwinkel's group. So this is this model, a two-state model. Again, you only can allow mutations in one direction uh, if you do this perfect phylogeny assumption. And so if you run this site model in this very simple data set, you get a phylogeny that looks like this, all right? So this SPTA mutation, note it's present in all cells we measured. So it's one of the first mutations that's on the tree. Uh, BRCA2 uh, is present in you know, a subset of cells. It ends up putting it here. FGFR1 is present in a subset of cells. It branches off, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you can see actually this branch between FGFR1 and MGMMT right here and here is because of these two exclusive patterns between the mutations on this block, right? So this is the, the tree that's inferred by the algorithm. Now, the algorithm, because it only allowed mutations to be gained, go from you know, the, uh, the uh, absent to present states here, actually imputed that all of this block right here should be filled in as present, that these were all missing mutations that we measured incorrectly because they're present in all the cells in this tree. Okay? So it assumed that these were all false negatives, right? So it filled in this, this uh, phylogeny in a very uh, interesting and strange way, right? And if you actually look at this, it actually means that there was a really high rate of missed mutations, right? All of these missing uh, entries has to be filled in with the mutation. According to so why did this happen? Again, it happened because we made this very restrictive assumption on the phylogeny. Okay, so let's relax that assumption. So the way to relax that assumption is that you assume you can go backwards. And so that's a model that allows mutations to be lost. So we can allow a mutation to have happened in a position, and then later it can go back to the unmutated wild-type state. So you assume that these things happen on a regular basis, that the mutation might be lost. And the mutation could be lost, uh, and it could be lost for a variety of reasons. Um, and, and so uh, this is one version of this model. It's called the DOLO model, uh, when you allow mutations to be re reversed in the other direction. Here it's called K-DOLO, because you allow only a maximum number of mutations. So if you run this model on this data, you get a different uh, solution here. You get, you know, bracket happening at the top again, but then down here, bracket two mutation is lost in a subset of cells. And that's again, this particular subset. Right. So we solve this problem sort of, is that we don't have to assume that we didn't measure this mutation. It happened originally, and then it was lost. But then another thing happens, which is, you end up having lots of mutations be lost. So all of these mutations down here are lost, these are lost. So you end up having every single mutation being lost somewhere else on the tree, which seems actually a little bit strange if you think about you know, the way the tumor might be evolving. Like every somatic mutation we measure is later lost. But, but just from a sort of biological point of view, you know, Gaining a mutation versus losing it, is the likelihood of that equal? It depends on what you think of loss. <laughs> okay, okay. And this is going to be the point of the next slide. Okay, fine. I'll yeah. let you, I'll no, let no, no, it's great. It's a great question. <laughs> so, uh, how do mutations get lost? Yes. So, one way is that mutations revert back to the original state. So, if we think about DNA, if you know the original wild type state here was the A. We have a somatic mutation here that mutates it to a C, then later it's lost because it mutates back to A. And it looks like the wild type state. Is it mutation or could it be repair? Or could it be, could it be repair? Um, could it be a number of things. Number of things, right? right okay. But there's actually another way mutations can get lost. Because there's not one type of somatic mutation in cancer. It's not just single nucleotide mutations. There's mutations across all scales. So the other way mutations can get lost 
is that the mutation happened here, went to C, but then this whole region was deleted. So there's no more somatic mutation. there. That whole chromosome containing the somatic mutation was deleted. But if it was, was, for example, amplified, so the same mutation happened Amplify. twice, would it be a loss or would it be um, an additional gain? If it was uh, amplified, then we have, let's sort of draw all the cases here. Here's the sort of wild type normal chromosome. We started with an A at this position, and then we mutated. And now we have a C at this position, right? And then you say, what if we amplify it? Well, we amplify, we make create many copies of the C. That will still look like we have the mutation, right? Okay. So now when we go sequence and we like, you know, sequence these different chromosomes, we'll just still be detecting the C. But what this is hinting at, all of this conversation is hinting at, is that just looking at single nucleotide mutations is insufficient if we want to do tumor evolution properly and copy number aberrations can happen, which, which they can and do. So. Question. Yes. Uh, are the cells in the mutation matrix ordered? Or does it matter? Uh, we ordered them uh, conveniently to show these blocks. <laughs> so you can sort them any way you want. The cells are disassociated. But yeah, we we sorted them to show you these these blocks. Yes. And in theory, is there there should be more than one solution, like more than one tree yeah. that you could there generate? could be many trees, yeah, yeah, that did it. So um, the algorithms here, this algorithm, this found the optimal tree under the assumption that mutations could only be gained. Yeah. And that was this tree I'm showing you. This algorithm allowed mutations to be lost, and it found the best tree when you allow mutations to be lost up to a certain number of times. Uh, and uh, the question actually though is, are, is there sort of more than one tree that, that one could fit with this? Can you, can you get a version of that where you allow the same mutation to appear in different places? Same mutation to appear in different places. You get bracket two up near the top, but then you also get it maybe like on a, like not in the top, you get it like yeah. later on a different branch, like, you know. Yeah, well, okay, but then then you have to think about what does it mean that the mutation happens uh, twice? Mm -hmm. But if it's on two different branches, say that have split earlier. Right? Yes, okay, great. So there's another way we could attempt to solve this problem is that maybe, and you're sort of suggesting something interesting, uh, which is <laughs> there's a group of cells that have BRCA2. So maybe these cells should be grouped together, but differently from these cells. So what you're suggesting is maybe the tree looks like who knows what, but on one branch, there's BRCA2 mutations, and then it branches, and then maybe over here, there's BRCA2 mutation. And it's different groups of cells. Yep. This so that, is also possible. But then you have to... Neither of these does that. Yeah, then you have, neither of these has that. But then you'd have to square that with the fact that, well, they also have other mutations. So you have to put all these partitions in the cells together. So what are you aiming for at the end, like to tell whether one is better than the other? So what you're um, aiming to do is to produce the phylogeny that uh, maximizes some uh, objective function, right? So some criteria, uh, and you score these phylogenies according to this model, okay? So this model is a very constrained model. Mutations only happen this way. It produces this tree. Uh, this model allows some constraint, it produces this tree, all right? Uh, so now we sort of look at them, like sort of what the evolution is, so like in evolutionary biology, they can argue all the time because we don't get to look at the past, right? Mm -hmm. But we can look at these trees and we can argue about, you know, whether either of them is actually sensible. Uh, this one doesn't seem very sensible because it would infer that we didn't measure a mutation a lot of time. If you go look at the data, this would be really unlikely because we would have a lot of uh, information telling us that there's no mutation in this cell. We would have to ignore all that information and say, no, no, that was a f we, we just didn't measure the mutation. So this one, looking at the data, actually is very unlikely. Uh, this one is a little trickier because we have to think that is it plausible that all of these mutations are 
gained and then lost. Mm -hmm. All right. So far. Yeah, yeah, homo places, right. Yeah. All right. Well, now I, now I have to change all my slides because we're going to end up in tumor evolution. <laughs> Let me, um, it's a whole different talk. Let me show you uh, the, the solution. It is about sort of homoplasy, uh, for sure. Let me show you a, uh, the, the, where we sort of thought about this, okay? So there's other information in the data about these copy number aberrations. So copy number aberrations, deletions of big regions of the genome. Turns out this data is not very good for detecting whether there are individual copy number aberrations. Why? Because you've measured only these small parts of the genome and you've measured them in this very targeted way. So if there's a deletion of the chromosome, you kind of can see this, but it's um, more challenging to see at an individual amplicon level. But one thing we can do is that we can actually group cells according to their total read coverage. So we group cells according to how many reads do they have covering all the locations on all of the chromosomes, okay? And this gives us a way of clustering cells according to their copy number profile, uh, which is um, not about calling any mutation in any particular position, uh, but uh, gives us instead a grouping of cells that now we need to preserve when we build this tree. So it's a different way of partitioning the cells. Okay. And so Can what I we just, end up trying to do, yeah. What do you mean by copy number profile? Yeah. <laughs> this is gonna come up again at the end. Uh, you, can, there's a, you can also draw in the, you can rub this out. <laughs> <clears throat> I should just skip to the <laughs> well, I can't do it very easily here. Uh, I have some nice images of this. Uh, okay, let me let me do it this way. All right. Uh, so Typical human genome has two copies of each chromosome. Let's look at chromosome one. There's the paternal copy and the maternal copy. It's very common in cancer that you will lose parts of chromosomes. So if I were to have an event that resulted in the complete loss of the paternal chromosome, now, this is a sort of single cell, one chromosome. Now when I sequence this cell, it has just one copy of chromosome one. Okay, so we could describe this as, as we look at the genome, how many copies of each part of the genome do we have? So now let me draw this out uh, in a way. If I sort of concatenate every single chromosome, it means that what we, way we can describe the genome is how many copies do we have of the maternal and paternal chromosomes. So a normal genome, we look like this. We've got one copy of each chromosome. Maybe I want to describe this at higher resolution. There are deletions or amplifications that are maybe only a million letters long. So instead I could think of not doing this at the chromosome level, but doing this at the level of, you know, some bin size. Maybe these are one megabase bins. Okay. So a copy number profile is just a sequence of these pairs of integers. So for this one, if chromosome one had one copy deleted, I would have a one zero. One copy of the paternal, zero copies of the maternal. Maybe chromosome two looks like this. Maybe chromosome three had an amplification. So it's three, one. Maybe this one lost the other chromosome, et cetera. So this is what copy number profile would be. How do the and means now, give you that? How do the means give us that? Yes. So uh, what we can do. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to use the whole board today. <laughs> <laughs> is take our data, 
which remember was these 300 amplicons. And for each of these amplicons, I record the number of reads that's present. Total number of reads I measured. So maybe I said the coverage was 50X. So an average, these numbers are maybe about 50. So maybe it's 30 here, you know, 52 here, you know, whatever, 28, 56, all right. Just certain number of reads, okay? Now, suppose in another cell, this is my first cell, cell two, I look at the total number of reads in these amplicons. This is five, you know, 10, and 52, 38, 27, et cetera. How did I get such low numbers of, of reads? Well, it could be that I was unlucky and I just didn't sequence that part of the genome very well. Or suppose these two amplicons were actually the two amplicons on chromosome one. The other way I might have determined that there's this number of slow number of reads is because one copy of chromosome one was deleted one copy of chromosome one is deleted, I would get fewer reads that align to chromosome one. Okay, so I could attempt to get a copy number profile from this type of data. Okay, now the challenge, and I'll maybe answer the question, the challenge is it's very hard to actually, from this type of data, exactly get this copy number profile, right? What would you think of if in this next cell, this number was 22? You know, is 22 a deletion or is it just that it should have been around 50 and we were unlucky? Hard to say, right? <laughs> so that's the sort of challenge of yeah. dealing with this is that you can't from this read count data directly predict these integer copy number profiles. Is there some like competition between these amplicons that causes this or no? Um, that would, causes what? That causes this discrepancy. Is this specific to that first location, say, this particular amplicon you said? No, it's just that, you know, again, the whole process when you do this is that you amplify your amplicons with PCR, right. and then you go have a bunch of DNA for that cell in your test tube. Everything's barcoded. And then sequencing is always a random process. And so you always just get... Uh, for any given amplicon, which molecules did you pick out of the test tube and sequence? Right? And it's a. Uh, it's all proportional to the presence of how much DNA you have there. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. It's proportional. There's a question here that I was doing. Yeah, um, about the technique, when you show the picture of the amplicons, they look non overlapping. Could you go <laughs> explain what? Is that the case? Is it because they have different starting sequences? Yeah. yeah. And how reliable are they have to be? Because if you are reading something in the middle, you may not read it because you are missing the starting point of the sequence, not necessarily because it's missing in your target. Right, so the way that these amplicons are designed in Mission Bio is that essentially it's, it's PCR primers. And so you yeah. just so choose- they, For each amplicon, is it the same primer? That's the question. No, 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 no. So you're, for each amplicon has amplicon specific primers that are gonna amplify- Let me rephrase that. Can you go back to your original thing? Because <laughs> uh, you see they are misaligned. So to me, that means that each amplicon has multiple tar starting primers and multiple ending primers. Oh, sorry, okay, okay. The amplicon is, uh, is this region that we amplified and then we sequenced it. And when we sequenced it, then we have reads that we sequenced and there's sequencing primers that okay. also comes so, so the, there so the is readings, only one pr one primer yeah yeah once you have the once you have the amplicons in your test tube then you sequence with these primers and the reads don't always get exactly you know at the start of the amplicon yes because uh, of the pcr timing but the point is if the data is missing you don't know if it's because the entire chunk is missing or your original am yeah. amplicon amplifier was yeah. misaligned. And that also happens too, where the, the well, the, the, the thing didn't amplify. So in certain cells, you may not actually have even amplified that yeah. region. So then the when you go to sequence- didn't like align at exactly. the temperature that the, the priming is at. Exactly. exactly. So how does your data deal with like normal heterogeneity in the SNP? Because like when you show it, you just show cell, but you have a paternal and a maternal. What if I have a SNP in only one versus the other. And the second question is, um, 
Oh, I lost it. You answered that, and then I'll come. It'll come back to me. Yeah. Um, so the data comes to you as a bunch of reads that are just a bunch of strings of length two hundred. Yes. And then you have to go align them to the genome, and you run a sequence and liner that tells you where in the genome did this read originate. Now you know which amplicons you were supposed to do, so you can align them only to those specific yes. regions of the genome. But you have two copies of a gene. Well, you have two copies of, of the chromosome, assuming yes. none of this stuff happened, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so when you align to the reference human genome, you align to just a hap what's called the haploid representation, right? So anytime people are doing read alignment, they're aligning to just the haploid. So they'll look like, you know, you don't know which one is maternal and you don't know which one is paternal, right? Yes. yes. Then in your data, they are all either yes or no. So how you decide what's yes, what's no? They have to be all mutated. And the other question was like, yes. you you said mutation and SNP, yes. which is totally fine, but there is three possible SNP per each point in the genome. Do you lump them together or do they have to be like specifically an A to T or a T to C? So uh, this all comes down to the decisions that are made to decide that there's a single nucleotide mutation. So here's my reference genome, you know, here's whatever the sequence is of the sample con, right? And then now we'll have in, you know, cell one, we'll have a bunch of reads that align like this. And so now we go look at these reads and we see that some of them have a T, which looks like the reference genome, and some of them have a G at this position. If we see enough Gs, we'll decide that there must be a difference from the reference genome, right? Yeah. So we'll decide that at this position, there's a G and a T, right? There's two. Now we'll have to decide, is this G a somatic mutation, or is it just that these were the two different alleles, maybe maternal and paternal, of this position? Yeah, so that, but also they could be that one is a mutation and one is not. But... One's a mutation and one's not, yeah. And, and so then we have to decide, was this a mutation or was this a germline variant? But you still didn't, I, so would that be a black or a white? So if we decide, so now I'm going to sort of, Even I'm going to answer the question to it. Is, yeah. is a mutation. Yeah. So let's let's now. Like, What's the threshold to consider a cell mutated when you have two alleles? Yeah. So oh, sorry. No, no, this is all great. This is all great. All good questions. So for this cell, this is all the data I'm looking at. This could either be. Let's interpret this both ways. This is either a the G is just the other parental chromosome, or the parental chromosomes are were originally TT, and this is a somatic mutation. Meaning the original two copies in the germline were TT, and this is now a TG. If I just gave you this data, and that's all I gave you for this one cell, and I gave you these reads, you couldn't you couldn't tell me which was the case. Or right? both of them could be mutations. Or both of them could be, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, also if you have normal you cells, you can yeah. compare it to them, right? Then we go back to a lot of our cells are gonna be normal cells. So we're not just the one cell, we'll have actually thousands of cells. And then we can start to look at, oh, well maybe actually in 30% of the cells, we, we saw only T. But do you know when you have a normal cell? Right, so how do we know we have a normal cell? You yeah. somehow, uh, if you have the pathology is something normal, then you have yeah. a run truth. Yeah, so we can, uh, we can have, we have to look at the data holistically, right? So what I'm showing you actually, yeah. I'm showing, I was trying to show you, but now I should realize I, I should have just given a completely different talk. <laughs> <laughs> but you are. <laughs> a completely different talk on the fly. Is, is, but what I attempted to show you was just the result of all of this bioinformatics mm -hmm. after you decided that mutations were. I'm going to try to rephrase this because we're still like, that's not what I ask. Yeah. For that to be considered, G is a mutation. 
We grant mm -hmm. truth. I oh, tell you, Jesus okay. mutation. Okay, so you told me Jesus okay. somatic mutation. Yeah. Okay. But of course, you have two alleles, so yeah. one is mutated, one is not. Yeah. You get roughly 50-50 reads. Is yeah. that considered a black in your board or a white in your board? Okay. It's a somatic mutation. Yeah. Okay. Any somatic. But what's the threshold? Is that fifty percent? Uh, that's uh, uh, you know, fifty percent is in the number of reads. It's probably less than that. Uh, it's you have to decide. What's your comfortable threshold? If I told you that on average I should get 50x coverage, yeah. then maybe I know that the number of reads that I get from the two copies varies. So maybe I'm comfortable if it's, you know, 30% of the reads or 20% of the reads. And that, so in your there is no differentiation between like a mutation that is on both chromosomes, paternal and maternal versus one in the board. Like, no, okay. you just thank you. That semantic mutation. Could be two. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to tell you this quickly and then totally go to the completely different part because uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to do something very different here. So I'm going to skip this. All right. So uh, let me just so show we you. See we're, in, we're learning a lot here. So yeah. Just, you may be suffering, but we're learning. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I'm going to. Tell you, okay, so now we can group the cells, going back to this, we now know there's mutations. Yeah. So although we can't predict what these copy number profiles were, we could take data like this that tells us these number of counts, and we could roughly group the cells according to whether or not we think they have these types of large copy number aberrations. So you could actually just think of this as just a clustering problem of these count vectors. So it's a very rough version of like, was there a deletion in this chromosome? Was there a duplication in this chromosome? But it just groups the cells into these populations. And those populations give us another way that we should be thinking about which cells to group together in the tree. And it's using different information. That's what I'm trying to sort of get at. It's not using information about which single nucleotide mutations are present, it's using mutation information about what big copy number changes are present in the cells. Okay? So a different type of somatic mutation that's common in cancer. If we do this grouping, we can actually then build this tree with this model that we call this constrained dolo model. <laughs> Maybe this cartoon will sort of say that this model, the original one that was very restrictive, it didn't allow any of these single nucleotide mutations to be lost. That gave us like a very rigid tree that was incorrect. This other model where losses could happen anywhere was very permissive and we ended up with like every mutation that occurred was later lost. And this model that's constrained, being constrained according to some hint about what these big events are ends up giving us sort of in between means, right? So when we run this new model, this is the tree that we get. So we cluster these cells, and now this is maybe people are used to the Tisney plot here, right? Each dot is a cell. I've just shown you a projection of these cells in 2D, but this is the clustering according to just these total counts. It's giving us information about what big changes have happened in the genome. Then using those big changes, using the information about the single nucleotide changes, we can pull them together and we get this tree. Okay, so what's interesting about this tree? So uh, the BRCA mutations are sitting up here now, sort of uh, early. Uh, TGF beta mutations happen in this partition here. FGF happens here. These two, there's only two mutations, these MGM1, two mutations are loss. Okay, so that's the tree. But what's interesting about this tree, and I should have shown you this on the others, is that this partition that we get into the two groups of cells is very consistent with the two regions of the tumor. So we threw all cells together when we built this tree, but they were from two distinct spatial regions of the tumor. And this bifurcation that we see actually splits almost perfectly. This is a fraction of cells that we would have assigned here 
87% of that from region one, 96% of the cells we assign here are from region two. So this is a, another piece of information. It wasn't used in constructing the tree, the spatial location of the cells that gives us some confidence that this is the true tree, at least better than the other two. And does biologically that have like meaning in the sense of why it would happen that way? Well, so there's a few things now that are kind of interesting about this. One, we actually uh, see that it turns out, related to this question, these MGM T mutations are actually not somatic mutations. They were germline mutations in this uh, uh, patient that we had missed because of these thresholds that had been used in calling the mutations, which we didn't do that analysis. So it turns out that, you know, they used the wrong threshold and they misclassified some of these mutations. More interestingly, the fact, the reason why we see them lost is because there is a decrease in this coverage, these total number of reads that happens right here at this locus. So the difference between cells in the green cluster versus the red cluster, we look at sort of the total number of reads at MGM is lower in the green than the red. And that's the sort of signal that that region has been removed from the tumor, There's fewer reads. So we do see some interesting things. What's sort of really cool here actually is that there's a bifurcation, two groups of cells. Some have TGF beta mutations. This is the beta signal to get receptor. Some have fibroblast growth factor mutations, and it's two distinct populations of cells that, that have these mutations that you know. This is sort of a partition that we get very nicely that was kind of missing from either of those two reconstructions. I don't All right. Have any questions, but yes. There is a lot of constraints that you play with in order to get the best treat. And in, in, in most of the models, people in this department do there's something called a like formation criterion, which is the way you can compare how good a model is in feeding data. Yep. Taking into account how many degrees of freedom the model has. So obviously, it's much easier to feed the model when you have lots of that. Exactly. Do you have something like that? Here? We didn't do that. There's a good suggestion, it's a good calculation. We would say that we have. Um, you know, the other model has too many degrees of freedom. That yes. was sort of the issue, right? That that's like right, right. losses were, yeah. could happen anywhere. Uh, because we cluster, we have many fewer degrees of freedom. Um, the, the challenge would be um, in how to calculate kind of the fit to data, because there's a lot of aspects of what does it mean um, in terms of the, the fit, because you'd have to, I guess, go back all, all pretty much all, to this read model of whether or not you believe the mutation or what. So it could be done. We haven't we haven't done it. You'd have to, you know, derive a probability for mutations being present or not. But it's a good suggestion. Okay, I'm going to move on because I wanted to. I promised you time and space. Uh, <laughs> and we took up a lot of time on time, so space. we'll go to space. Uh, I'm going to skip this part, which is lineage tracing. It's cool. It's more stuff in time, but I don't want to ex uh, explain the technology. So let's go to space. Um, so we can barcode these individual spots. Now, this is um, a really fast moving technological field. There's like a bunch of different technologies for doing spatial sequencing. Um, the ones I'm gonna talk about are not the imaging based ones, but the ones that are based on sequencing, right? So the way that uh, these technologies work is that you barcode, not individual cell, uh, disassociated cells, but you barcode locations on a 2D tissue slice. And then you can sequence those barcoded spots with DNA or RNA sequencing. So the resulting data looks like for each spot, you can do this for thousands of spots in most locations, for every gene in the genome, these for the technologies I'm gonna talk about, you get a count of the number of RNA molecules that you measured. This is what you would get from a single cell RNA sequencing experiment. But the new piece of information is that for every spot, you know it's 2D location in the tissue. Okay, so this, this is this new piece of information that you don't get when you do disassociated cells. How many cells in one spot? Perfect. So that's what's down here. So for the different technologies, they vary in terms of their spatial resolution, how big are the spots, and how many spots are there. 
and how much coverage, and now you know that term, mm -hmm. how much, how many reads did I sequence from each spot? And those are like the three knobs that you can turn with some constraints on physical constraints and financial constraints on how much you can tune each knob. So there are different ways people have tuned this. So the most commercially available technology uh, for this is from 10X Genomics and it's called Visium technology. That gives you about 5,000 spots. Each spot is 55 microns in diameter. So depending on your cell size, that's anywhere from say five to 20-ish cells per spot. So not single cell. Uh, but there are other technologies that go down to maybe one micron to almost single cell resolution. With these technologies, when you go down in resolution, the trade-off is usually that you get fewer reads per spot. So the, the RNA or DNA measurement is not as reliable at these individual spots. Another technology I'll show you some data from is uh, SlideSeq. Uh, this is, is from the Broad Institute. Here they have slightly smaller beads, 10 micron, uh, so almost getting close to single cell resolution for most spots, but with lower coverage. All right. Uh, so how, how deep is the sample, if you know what I mean? Because uh, I sample that when they do what a tissue slice, you probably know this better than mine. I think me, I think they're about 10 microns usually. Right. So that's like it, a, it's like cutting cells up in yeah. some sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they usually do like 10 micron slices. Okay. So. Since it's lunchtime, you've eaten, I haven't eaten. Uh, I'll give you this sort of analogy. I'm not responsible for this analogy, but uh, bulk RNA sequencing, which people used to do, if you think of each cell as a piece of fruit, the bulk measures this mixture, right? So not very good. Uh, single cell measures the fruit salad, where you've got the individual cells, but they're, you know, you've lost their spatial context. Spatial transcriptomics gives you the beautiful fruit tart, right? The cells in their spatial context. So I'm not responsible for this analogy, but well, it's a quite sort of, the right analogy. It's a sort of pixelated fruit tart. Yeah, because, <laughs> and your question is very important. If you think about Visium, you, you did this, and then actually you didn't measure the individual pieces of fruit, so you really get a bunch of mini fruits. <laughs> that's, that's how you can really think about it. Which is a little bit better, right? <laughs> and than getting just one fruit fruit. So there's some information. Um, so what can you do with this data? Lots of stuff, right? Uh, so anything you want to do with single cell RNA sequencing, you could do with spatial RNA sequencing, but better, because you can do it in space, right? So if I were to uh, cluster spots, across, you know, by looking at their gene expression, I might get something like cell types, right? Gene expression clusters, but now they're gonna be localized in space. So here's an example of that. This is data from the prefrontal cortex, spatial transcriptomics, and they sort of grouped spots and they're grouped according to their expression, but you get very clearly the layers of the prefrontal cortex, so white matter and these other distinct layers. Uh, here's a tumor example. that's kind of lower resolution data where uh, they group according to gene expression, so they do gene expression clustering, but then you can see where those clusters are in space. And so you can pick out kind of the individual uh, uh, tumor regions according to their gene expression that matches pretty well with the histology in this version. So that's cool. You could look at an individual gene. So if you're interested in one gene, it's like one column of this matrix, but now you can look at its expression in space. So how is this one gene changing an expression in space? Uh, and here, this is a gene that is known to be a marker gene for this layer three. And you can see it's high expression here and, and, and low elsewhere. Uh, if you look at pairs of genes and correlations in space between say maybe neighboring spots, you might be able to uh, think about cell-cell communication. So people have like take, you know, the expression of a ligand and a receptor from nearby spots, is their expression correlated? That might give you some indication of a cell-cell communication. So this is all really cool. This is like great stuff. Um, but as I said, nothing's perfect, right? And so the challenge here is that the real data, because of limitations in technology, it's not single cell, but also this count matrix is very sparse. You have limited number of RNA reads per spot. These are what are called unique molecular identifiers. This is probably older, so 2,500, maybe you can get like 10,000. So 10,000 RNA molecules from a single location. But when there's you know, 20,000 genes in the genome, that's not really that many reads. It doesn't really give you a lot of resolution for expression. There's a lot of zeros in this matrix. It's very sparse data. So this beautiful picture I showed you is not the raw data. The raw data looked like this. 
You know, and now maybe if you stare, you can kind of see that, you know, it's higher here than elsewhere, but you know, it's a lot of noise. Okay, so what can we do in terms of improving this uh, data quality computation? Okay, so we have this issue, really it's like issue mostly of kind of sparsity. We like under sequence each spot because we've sequenced many spots. So if you want to think about how you can improve data sparsity, the data needs to have some structure. Unfortunately, you know, biology tissues are structured. So the uh, two ways we've been thinking about this, and given the time, I'll probably only be able to talk about one, uh -huh. uh, is, is if you just had one tissue slice, then you could try to model the structure in that one slice. Okay? And so you want to somehow model the geometry of the slice. But the other thing we've done is that in data sets where there are multiple slices, uh, we can attempt to align and integrate them across space. Okay, and that then allows you to get like these 3D reconstructions. My pictures aren't as good as, as, as Chandler's. They're like, yeah, <laughs> these much nicer pictures of this stuff, but you can align the space, but you could also actually integrate them in space and sort of um, uh, create kind of a single meta slice that contains uh, information from both. So let me show you the uh, model tissue geometry part. So, what there are many methods that, that sort of do this, and most of them sort of look at uh, how the tissue is locally in space. And they use the fact that tissues are structured. So if I'm looking at this one spot here, and I'm interested in the expression of a gene in this one spot, then probably the expression of the gene in this spot is similar to the expression of its neighbors most of the time, right? Nearby cells maybe like to be together. So you sort of views this local neighborhood information. So this is great. There's a bunch of ways you can do this and you could do, you know, uh, various types of, of correlations and Markov random fields. And, you know, these days, like various types of graph neural networks to model these local correlations. We were kind of interested in these tissues that were layered because we were looking at these prefrontal cortex tissues and they had these very distinct layers. And, you know, by eye, we can look at these and say, hey, there's these layers, you know, and the skin has layers, there's layers in the intestine, and certainly local correlations are present in these layers, but there's more, more global pattern here, right, that we can all see, and we'd say, oh, this is layered, this thing is layered, this, you know, what, so what does it mean that it's layered and that it has this global geometry? Yeah. So what's the meaning of local neighborhood here? You mean like cell to cell or one cell to cell or two cells? What's the you know, local, say, what's the damage? Yeah, so, you know, the simple version of this would be uh, you just build like a, a nearest neighbor connections and you sort of look at one spot and you look at its neighbors. Okay, in Media one cell or yeah. one, one, cell? one spot, one spot, you know, one, one spatial spot. I don't say one cell because the spot could have multiple cells if it's too big, you know. But yes. So one spot uh, include how many cells on average? I'm, I'm just thinking so the local neighborhood means how many cells from one, for example, center cells. Right. So let's let's take the Visium data. The spot is 55 micron, so it contains roughly 20 cells. Mm -hmm. And we look at the nearby spots, right? So we're looking, you know, cell-wise, we might be looking 40, 50 cells apart, right? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so that's sort of the definition of local. But you know, this is this has even you know longer range similarity if we think about the layers. So how how do we model this kind of longer range similarity? Uh, so we thought a lot about this, uh, and we started with uh, real but simple tissues where the layers are we could rotate and they're beautifully aligned with one of the two axes. Okay, and if they're sort of aligned this way, then you might think that if this really is this layered tissue, and I've colored them here according to these annotations of cell types, according to their layers. And so, you know, kind of the, the hint here, according to this uh, structure, is that, you know, the gene expression is really maybe only depends on the X coordinate, sort of constant in Y, right? As you move along, it's, you know, it's not changing in the Y direction. The color doesn't change. The cell type composition doesn't change in the Y direction. So then you could try to model this by a function of just X, okay? single variable function. And so we did this and we developed this method uh, as called 
uh, belayer, you know, because it's sort of a play on the word layer. And, and also Utstaf, who's sort of partially included here as a rock climber. So he, you know, as he's like, <laughs> those who rock climb the belayer or somebody, you know, holds the rope, I guess. Uh, and so belayer, what it did is it used just a, a one variable model when the tissues were aligned. But then, of course, many tissues, the ones I showed you like this, are curved. And we look at this and we're like, oh, this is layered, right? By eye, these are layers. But it's these curved layers. So how do you model that? And we spent a good amount of time and some beautiful math. And I really should just give a talk on this whole thing. <laughs> uh, because usually I skip this part. And I skipped this part. But I could read. I should have read on the whole slide. Because there's a beautiful bunch of math that this audience probably knows about how to take curved uh, geometries and straighten them out. There's a whole field of complex analysis where you do this with what are called conformal maps, which preserve locally the angles. And so you could take these arbitrary curved layers and straighten them out. Turns out here, we only need like the real part of the conformal map. So it's a harmonic function. So you can think about this as a heat equation. We wrote all this down. We're really proud of this paper. You know, it's like, I think some beautiful math in this paper. Uh, and and we, uh, we, we really love it. It's great. The problem is, it's actually pretty hard to compute these maps when you don't know anything, right? And again, we, we know not, we start with just this sparse gene expression. So it works, we can show it works, we can do special cases. Uh, and then, you know, uh, Ustav came to me one day and he's like, you know, if we wanna compute this function, you know, these days people don't really think hard about computing functions. I mean, who takes complex analysis these days? How many of you have taken complex analysis? <laughs> So I was like way more than most audiences, but still it was only, it was only like 40%, right? So, you know, it takes a lot of time to learn all that. Stuff. And who has time for it these days, right? Uh, so why don't we just replace this sort of complicated thing, replace natural intelligence with artificial intelligence, right? Uh, and so replace this thing with just a neural network. Okay. Now the neural network that was quite interesting in that, because of the way we were thinking about this, what this way thing, the way this is structured is, the input is the 2D spatial coordinate, the output is the expression of all genes. Okay? So you could, trying to predict expression from just spatial location. But the trick is that all of it goes through one neuron in the middle. And what this neuron is describing is a single variable in space. Okay. And the single variable is that one dimensional coordinate that we were learning before. Okay. So by setting this up this way, what the model's learning is first the geometry in this first part. How do you kind of describe the single coordinate? And then how do you describe expression as a function of the single coordinate? So we sort of have an interpretable network. Now, I'm not gonna do the calculus interlude because this is a sophisticated audience. Uh, I'm going to show you then the sort of analogy that you show. What is this single variable function? This is what we call the topography of the tissue slice. Because if you think about a uh, function in 2D to 1D, we could describe the level curves of this function as you would describe, say, the elevation of a surface the elevation of the earth, right? So here's a map, a hiking map. If you're used to seeing these maps, each curve gives you constant elevation. Uh, and then you could describe from one of these maps, all sorts of physical properties. Temperature is a function of elevation. Pressure is a function of elevation. UV radiation is a function of, of elevation. They're all different functions of elevation, but elevation is like the underlying geometry of this surface. And so that's, in a sense, what we're doing here. So we're learning this underlying geometry, these level curves that describe the tissue structure. And then we're learning the expression of each gene as a function of this common coordinate. It seems crazy. It seems really silly to do this. I do not think this would work. And remarkably, on some tissues, it works beautifully. So here is a... a Spatial transcriptomics of SlideSeq. So this is very low coverage data. Uh, and you just take the gene expression 
you run this method, it's called Gaston. That means gradient something, something, but it's also <laughs> something you do with climbing if there's any rock climbers. Uh, and, and you just run the thing and out pops this topographic map. And then you could take that topographic map and you can partition it, partitioning the mountains and valleys in the topographic map into these spatial domains. And in this case, these spatial domains line up very well with the annotated layers of the cerebellum. Right. There's these layers of oligodendrocytes and the granule <laughs> layer and the Perkinje Bergman layer. Uh, and you just get this geometry. You just learn it. Correct. So this is done on like a moving window of through the space. It's not done it's as done a whole, whole thing. thing all at once. Oh. It's just magic. It just seems like. You know, it's just AI magic. <laughs> it's just, you just take Weird. the whole transcript count matrix, you just run it through this neural net. And then what I'm showing you here is just that single coordinate that it learned. That's it. And then here I'm just partitioning that coordinate, just partitioning like the elevation of the surface. That's it. All the whole thing. All the answer. That is really cool. Uh, so here's just an example of you know this data. So the slide seek V2 it has about 500 UMIs per spot. The spots are 10 microns, so almost single cell. But like your counts, your total RNA molecules per cell is super sparse. There's very little signal in one spot. So if you draw the raw data, it looks like just noise for this gene, like hardly anything, right? It's just like speckled noise. But we can draw the expression as a function of this single coordinate we learned. So again, this coordinate is these going along this increasing elevation. So that we call this the iso depth of the surface. So if I were to plot this gene as a function of going from the pink, you know, the low elevation iso depth through the green, through the purple, what you can see by pooling this information along this coordinate is that this gene peaks right here at this Perkinje Bergman layer and then decreases. This is exactly where it's supposed to be because this is a gene that's a marker gene for Perkinje Bergman neurons. So if I were to show you the imputed expression in 2D, you see this map where it's very highly expressed here and low elsewhere. So learning the geometry, right? We're learning this underlying geometry. All right, let me, this is of course, you know, not a neuroscience audience. So what about tumors? Yes. What about tumors? Uh, so we can do this in some tumors, not all, but some. Uh, here's a colorectal tumor. So here's the H&E uh, image of this tumor. We run the algorithm. It sort of learns this kind of layered structure. Uh, this region right here is exactly where the pathologist has annotated the tumor cells. So that's nice. But what we have, remember, is a continuous coordinate along this whole slice, this isodepth coordinate, right? As shown by this sort of contour map. And you know, you can take the gradients of that contour map and look at directions of maximal change in expression. So now we can plot any gene as a function of this coordinate, right? We fit every gene's Expression is a function of coordinate. And then we can classify genes. And how do they change in expression when you go from the adjacent stroma into the interior of the tumor? And so there are genes that maybe increase in expression as you go to the boundary of the tumor and then are constant. There are genes that have discontinuous jumps in expression from the adjacent stroma to the tumor. There are ones that are constant in the stroma, but then increase or decrease in expression inside the tumor. You could get all of these gene expression gradients. And again, you can see these because you're not looking at just one individual spot. You're looking at all locations that are sort of reflective of how far away you are from the boundary of the tumor. And so here's a few of these genes that uh, are constant in the stroma and then increasing in expression. We have many of these genes. If you just do like some gene set analysis of this, what pops up for these genes that are increasing expression are genes that uh, suggest a metabolic gradient, something about oxidative phosphorylation mm -hmm. in, in this tumor. So we think what we're capturing, and this is sort of well known, is of course there's regions of hypoxia inside tumors. And so we could sort of, we think, see this gradient of metabolic expression as you go into the interior of the tumor here. Uh, there's a, here's another pattern. This is just one gene, but these are genes that sort of are increasing in expression as you get close to the boundary of the tumor, but then are relatively constant inside the tumor. These genes, when you sort of just do some gene set type analysis, there's a lot of uh, EMT genes that are coming up here. 
also sort of consistent with what one would expect, sort of increase in expression in EMT genes near the boundary of the tumor. Okay, so this is just a few of the, the patterns that we're, we're picking out. Uh, so there's still a lot more to do. We're running this on, on many more tumors. This is just one, one example, uh, but this is uh, the sort of summary of, of this method of Gaston. Okay, so the idea again, we learn this topographic map of the tissue slice. This is another example of a olfactory bulb. We learn this elevation plot. We can then look at gene expression, cell type composition as a function of this learned coordinate. So we're sort of we think learning some of the latent geometry of the tissue slice. Can you, by the way, from the, for the same spots, um, can you also um, sequence the DNA? Ah, uh, yeah, we would love to do this. Uh, so unfortunately, spatial DNA sequencing is much harder to do, and there's very little of it. And uh, there's uh, slide DNA sequencing from, from the same group that did slide RNA, FHN. And we've looked at some of that data, and it's cool, but it's very low coverage. So we love to get spatial DNA. Yeah. Do I have any more? If I have five more minutes, that's the last part yes. I wanted to show. Okay, good. So you I'll show you our attempt to do this, I guess. <laughs> I have two questions, but I'm happy to wait for them until the end, if you have five minutes now, so. Okay, I'm gonna to try to wrap two things together. Answer your question, what about DNA? And this weird, mysterious stuff about copy number aberrations, okay? So in order to do that, I gotta skip this middle part. So this is the alignment stuff. This is paste, but you know, uh, I'm gonna skip this part. We started doing spatial sequencing. We got interested in spatial sequencing because we were doing all this evolution stuff, right? What we just spent three quarters of the talk talking about. Uh, we were really into this stuff. You have to, you know, if you're looking at somatic mutations, you're looking at DNA sequencing. We'd love to have spatial DNA, but we don't have it. And so we're really hoping, we wanted to get spatial tumor evolution, but we don't have good spatial DNA sequencing. So what could we do? We think again about these copy number aberrations. There are many types of mutations in cancer. Large copy number aberrations leave a footprint in RNA expression. So there's a lot of spatial RNA sequencing, hardly any spatial DNA. So we thought, okay, look, I mean, if you delete chromosome one, you know, then the genes on chromosome one tend to be underexpressed. If I amplify chromosome eight, the genes on chromosome eight tend to be overexpressed. So there's sort of this signal of changes in expression due to copy number changes. And there are methods that have tried to identify large deletions and duplications of the genome from these changes in expression. They've done it from single cell RNA data. But of course, it's really hard to do this reliably because, I mean, gene expression changes for all sorts of reasons, right? It nothing to do with copy. I mean, there's just, I mean, gene regulation, you know, there's all sorts of changes in gene regulation that are not induced by copy number. So it's quite hard to do this. And so our thought was, maybe we could actually do two things. One, we could use the fact that we have spatial RNA sequencing to get us better copy number aberrations. And then once we had those copy number aberrations, we could use them to do tumor evolution, okay? So how could having spatial data give us better chance of getting copy number aberrations? And they, would if we made sort of one mild assumption, which is that nearby spots in a tumor tend to be genetically similar. Right? Not all the time, but like, yeah, cells divide, they don't all just migrate randomly, right? So nearby tend to be genetically similar. So what that means is that when you're uh, trying to identify whether there's a copy number aberration in a particular spot, and you have this noisy expression data, if you try to do this simultaneously across multiple spots, there's information because if they're near each other, you should be making the same or similar predictions about whether there are deletions and duplications, right? The genome should be similar for nearby spots. We had done this previously in a method. This was our very first paper on spatial transcriptomics was not RNA at all. It's like on copy number aberrations. But there was one really important thing that we didn't do, which turns out to be actually quite interesting. And that's that, and now you've sort of seen this, and I almost should have skipped to this slide. There's two copies of every part of the genome, usually, maternal and paternal. 
when there's a copy number aberration, it changes, perturbs one of the two copies, right? So what most people have done, including our previous work, was we just tried to look at how many total copies did we have? We had two, that's normal. If you have three, that's an amplification. If you have one, that's a deletion. But instead, we should be calling these pairs. And I already described this for you, sort of previewing this part. So the reason why is that there are really interesting events that happen. So here's an event where there are two copies of the paternal chromosome and zero of the maternal. This is what's called a copy neutral, total copy doesn't change, loss of heterozygosity, because you are no longer heterozygous at any locus. These actually are really common in tumors. Right? If you just call total copy number, you won't even see this because the total number of copies is two. Other interesting things that happen is that sometimes you'll get the total copy number doesn't change in different cells in the tumor, but if you looked at how many maternal and paternal copies there were, you would see that these two cells were different. They might have two of one, one and one of the other, for example. These are called mirrored subclonal copy number. So we'd seen these things in single cell DNA sequencing. So we wanted to see if we could uncover them in spatial sequencing. It's very hard because the signals are all very noisy. You have to look at this signal. I don't think I should go into describing this. Let me just sort of cut to the chase and say that we developed a method that will take in the spatial transcriptomics data. And what it models is two types of correlations in the data. Correlations along the genome, because this is this type of thing, that if there's a copy number change, the number of counts should be correlated along the genome. If I delete a whole chromosome, then every gene on the genome and chromosome one should change. So correlations along the genome, this with a hidden Markov model. Then we model correlations in space. Nearby cells are likely to be genetically related. And so we jointly model both of these. This is what this algorithm Calico ST is called. The output is these copy number profiles, right? For each region of the genome, how many copies of the maternal and paternal allele do I have? And then for each of these copy number profiles, these are what we call clones. So these are you know, groups of spots. You don't get a copy number profile for each spot, you just get groups of them because uh, you, you know, have to avoid overfitting. Uh, and then you can build a phylogeny, you can build the relationships between these, but you can look at how the tumor is evolving in space. Okay? So you've got genetic and geographic information linked together. So that's what we're producing with this algorithm. Uh, let me, this is, don't worry about the benchmarking here, but uh, this is just to show you. So here's uh, two uh, slices from a, a liver metastasis from a colorectal tumor. So let me sort of walk you through this. The algorithm infers that there are three cancer clones. So clone, again, is a population of spots. I didn't tell you how many spots are assigned to each clone, but, but here, here they are. And then there's a copy number profile for each spot. So this is a sort of look at this, this annotation. So in light gray, this corresponds to copy number 1-1. One, one. So 1-1... One, one, is when nothing happened, right? One maternal, one paternal. In yellow, this is two one. So two one means we have one extra copy of that chromosome. Okay, so now you can see clone one, you know, it's got a lot of two one, it's called a triploid tumor, but it's got also some chromosomes that are unaltered by copy number. And then the really interesting ones is this dark gray here. This dark gray is the two zero. The two zero means there's two copies of say the maternal and zero of the paternal. So something interesting has happened actually, but it's, you know, we just were at looking at the total copy number we would miss it. All right, so we, we get these things, here's three clones. You can relate these clones by a tree according to whether or not they share these copy number aberrations and you get this tree. You can see where these clones are in space. Okay, so here's the three clones in space across the two slices. You can sort of see them and then you can uh, actually reconstruct the evolution in 3D. Because now if we align these two slices, then you can sort of see that what's happened is this founder clone is the green clone according to the genetics. And then the descendant clones, blue and orange, are branching out, acquiring new copy number aberrations, but also branching out in space. So we're getting what's called the phylogeography of the tumor. So you now start to do these reconstructions in space uh, and, and time. Let me show you one more and then we'll end because we're almost at time. 
This is uh, a paper, not our paper, previously published data from a, a single prostate, but they took multiple spatial sections from this prostate tumor, and they did this Visium spatial transcriptomics. We run the copy number algorithm on all slices simultaneously. And what we infer are these different clones. You can see them sort of in color. You can see sort of how the colors are very consistent across the different slices. The algorithm didn't know which slices were in space. So the fact that they're consistent is actually a good thing for us, which is the algorithm is doing something uh, useful. You see, of course, that the clones have bifurcated here in space. And what I'm showing you on top is the actual phylogeography that was inferred from the copy number operations. And you can see that right here is where we infer the root, the ancestral cell would have been. It branches in two directions, here and here, and then spreads locally in the two left and right sides. And the really fascinating part is that this branch from left to right is these two clones up here in red and green have various copy number changes. In fact, and these have copy number changes, this is one of the most fascinating events in the tumor because these arrows are indicating, white, blue here is one zero. One zero in copy number means either the maternal or the paternal chromosome was lost. Okay, so chromosome two either lost maternal or paternal, and the arrows are indicating whether it was maternal or paternal. So you get this bifurcation in genetic space and in physical space. And it's revealed by loss of the two different parental alleles. So it's like the strongest evidence almost you could hope for in the data, complete loss of either maternal or paternal in the two branches of the prostate. So the whole thing actually just sort of beautifully works in terms of thing. We can look at SNVs going back to what we're talking about and SNVs are sort of consistent with the story. Okay, so there's, there's the end. Uh, so I've tried to bring a bunch of things together, started with evolution, evolution in time. We got really bogged down in evolution in time, unfortunately, but hopefully it was instructive. <laughs> then we went to space. We did space with just RNA expression, which is what most people look at in space. And we were able to talk about tumor heterogeneity in space because we could find these spatial gradients. And then we brought the two things together, which is actually looking at evolution in time and space by calling copy number aberrations from RNA data. So someday we hope to get really good DNA data. Then we won't have to do all this shenanigans with trying to predict you know, DNA events from RNA. And then you can really do these reconstructions in, in an amazing way. Right? So that's, that's sort of the future. The future is coming quickly. So uh, there's going to be a lot of cool stuff to happen. And I think the, the other, I would say, interesting part of this is, and I was sort of thinking about this as, as, as Sandy was introducing, is that you know, I think we're headed towards a real convergence of the omics world and the modeling world. Because you know, in the modeling world, you all have been thinking a lot about physical space and physical properties, et cetera, and how you model those in time and space. In the genomics world, for the large part, we've been mostly thinking about high dimensional data sets and all the cells, who cares where they were, and they're just all a bunch of data. And now because of spatial technologies, you know, we're now thinking a lot about physical space and time and how things change over space and time, but with this high dimensional omics measurement. So I think the future is bright for doing you know, more things together. Indeed. And hopefully uh, next time I come, I'll be better prepared. To <laughs> be able to... <laughs> so I'll just leave you with a question that mm. in my group, we are not always so well positioned to answer because we're sitting in a computer science department but I think it's a question I always get asked. And I think probably many of you here are better positioned to like answer things about the clinical implications of tumor heterogeneity across time and space. Um, so that's it. We, we sort of reach time. I apologize for getting bogged down, but I appreciate all the good questions and keeping me honest. And uh, if, if there's any time left, I'm happy to take more questions, but thank you for hosting. I can uh, uh, your problem, maybe? So you could be Oh yeah, yeah. let me see if I can get that. To that might just be a compliment gun. Oh yeah. Yes, yes, yes. There was a question. Yeah, I mean I, I missed some of these at the beginning. Yeah. Oh glad I got the facial stuff because <laughs> control yeah. is still so nicely, yeah. But I do appreciate you guys asking all the questions again. This means very few questions about the relationship between those clones, like re the regions, certain clones were growing or being selected in certain microenvironment in the tumor. Did you also do some correlations with the gene expression profile? Yeah, yeah, and that, that's, that's a great question. We have all the, I mean, it's RNA data, right? Sure. And so um, 
these projects have been, and you know, I've been trying to acknowledge the people who did the work as, as we go. Um, they've been happening kind of with different people in the group who are kind of focused on one or the other, but that that would be a great thing to look at with the RNA data is that we can look at tumor microenvironment and think about maybe if that's impacting evolution in this case. We kind of need a little more, not, we, we do actually also have more numbers. I just showed you one, but now we've got like 50 or 60 of these um, uh, uh, tumors. So we can, you know, start to maybe look at these types of things and, and make sure that they're not just accidents of one tumor. You know? Yeah. And also that pater paternal or maternal chromosomes and maybe expression pattern changes for certain genes, the same gene set, right? But yeah. Yeah. That might be selection, actually, and it could be nice mix. Exactly. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one very quick question? Sure. Please. So this is, by the way, really awesome work. I really love the concept of tumor geography. <laughs> uh, but it, when you are trying to do the hidden Markov model and predict, mm -hmm. predict it over time, how do you validate that? Because you can only size the tumor once, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. So the the... The, the hidden Markov model um, here was, was uh, to look at correlation across the genome, right? Uh -huh. So we didn't have like a temporal element to this. Okay, gotcha. um, we would love to get uh, temporal uh, spatial tumor data. Um, I, I, I had inserted one slide in here to just talk about one version of this. And in and, and talking to you some, I inserted the slide because this talking to somebody this morning and you know, I was hearing about how you sometimes get multiple, you get biopsies from multiple time points, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so one of the things we're really interested in, this is not tumor data, this is a mouse kidney, mm -hmm. is that we're doing now spatial temporal alignments mm -hmm. uh, in space. It actually turns out to be a really fascinating and interesting problem because mm -hmm. um, this is not tumor, this is kidney, but same thing true in tumors. You know, we already had a way to align in space, like if you have multiple consecutive slices, and that works. When we did time in this application and others, over time, cells change a lot. Like cells grow, cells die, cells differentiate in development. And so our other way of doing it wasn't actually modeling all these processes. And so now we have ways that we think we can model growth in cell types over time or death over time and mm -hmm. align and register. So we would love to get you know, spatial temporal data, uh, you know, to both do this type of thing, but we could also do the evolution angle and that would potentially be a way to validate. Without the space, we sometimes have been able to get um, like pre post treatment, like single cell DNA, and then we can a little bit validate some of that tumor evolution stuff, mm -hmm. you know, but not, we haven't been able to get spatial temporal data in cancer yet. Yes, chef. Thank you. Well, we're already over, and I want to ask the last question. <laughs> <laughs> this is my prompt. Um, it was more a comment, actually, on your <laughs> final statement about clinical implications. And so, you know, there there is a lot of um, sort of interest in the evolution of drug resistance. And drug resistance is a fundamental issue clinically for any therapy that we have in cancer, right? And as we um, get more spatial information, um, how are those resistant clones versus their non-resistant counterparts spatially distributed? Yeah. Are they, is there actual structure to that? And so it's kind of an interesting when you show that and there's a clear kind of separation in these clonal architectures. Um, could one of them be more responsive to a drug or resistant to a drug? Or could there be drugs that targeted different parts of that tumor? And could we be smart about how we leverage that because one's in the interior and one's on the outside or something? Yeah, yeah. So um, that's where I see there could be real potential to combine the kind of genomic and um, what's the expression aspects, yeah, right? Yeah, um, so can right now, we don't, we can't get that information easily, right? But one of the things that we have been gathering is ctDNA, right? Yeah. But that's going to give you um, sort of low resolution expression um, rather than mutation, right? Yeah. At Although least, we, we've been working on getting copy right. number and mutation. But presumably, there'll yeah. be a time where we can get all of the above, but yeah. it'll be non spatial. Yes. But all of these things are sort of facets of that question because one of the things that we'd love to be able to do is 
understand the current state of the patient's tumour and then shift our treatment to how that patient's tumour is changing and keep shifting your treatment with a strategy. It could be to control it or it could be to try and eradicate it. Um, but that's really the kind of promise of that yeah. type of approach. right? Yeah. So I, I see that really as being a, a critical future translational goal. Sounds like you're thinking about it. Yeah, we're, we're thinking about, you know, for us, we think about what are the um, computational bottlenecks to doing that. Yeah. Uh, and, and so we try to address those. But, yeah, love to keep talking as, as yes. you guys think about this and get the data sets for it. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks again. Yes, ben. thank you.